And today's sponsor is Reconciled. Reconciled invoices your clients, pays your bills, and delivers clear and accurate financial reports every month automatically. Ready to streamline your financials and prepare your business for the next big step? Visit Reconciled.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. I'm here today with Jason Somerville, and he is the founding partner at GW Partners and has a vast amount of knowledge and experience in this industry. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for being on the show today, Jason. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and we talked about for a little while getting to know each other before the show. We always do the kind of origin stories so people can get a kind of feel for who you are. The whole vibe I want is for people to connect with you and understand the vastness of your experience. So you don't have to sure. go too long into it, but can you give us the scope? Because you've got a wide range of things you've done in the past. My joke is always, say, hey, you were born and now you ended up on a show about mergers and acquisitions. Can you fill out the gap in between? But give us the condensed version. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, I think the best way to put it is I'm kind of a, a reformed investment banker back to still being an investment banker, but a little bit different than I started. It's funny. When I was uh, in high school, I had my heart set on being a sports agent, believe it or not. And once I realized I had to probably go to law school to do that, and I didn't want to be a lawyer, I was like, okay, that's not, I don't want to do that. So I went the finance route and started my career with Bank of America and their investment banking practice in Chicago, where we did deals, kind of equity, M&A for Fortune 500 businesses. Did that for a few years and then actually went and ran capital markets for a, a hedge fund in Miami called Bayview Asset Management. If I gave you the list of stuff we did there, we'd be here for two hours. Cause just like a typical hedge fund, we did all kinds of stuff. And then after that period of time, that world, that kind of traditional investment banking world is hardcore when it comes to lifestyle and working and it's hundred hour weeks. It's all that. And. To be frank, I had two small kids and I wasn't seeing a whole lot of them. And I was like, you know what? I don't think I want to keep going down this road anymore. And so I, I left, actually did a little bit of a sabbatical reset and decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur and kind of went down a few different paths with that. Again, I did stuff in aviation. I'm a, actually a helicopter pilot. I, I had a helicopter leasing company. I went down the road of, of actually home and business accessibility modifications. So we would my remodel homes and, and put in things like handicapped elevators and things like that at businesses to make them accessible. That was an awesome experience. And then also did a lot of consulting and kind of brokering and even got heavily involved in the gold mine in Panama. So all kinds of fun stuff. You know, it was through one of the exits. It was actually through the exit of the home modification business that I had that I you know worked with an intermediary in particular and, and said, you know what? I feel like this is something I want to do. I want to help founder owners in particular. I want to help the smaller business owner assess hopefully expertise that I have, you know, from all of my years in training in big finance, big investment bank, and try to really bring that to help people that have spent so much of their lives often, so much of their time, blood, sweat, tears, building a business. And ultimately, in my view, I felt like they deserve the best possible outcome that they can get. That's where we started with GW Partners. And we started out as a generalist kind of firm. We helped a lot of different businesses across a lot of different industries, but then started fairly soon focusing heavily in consumer, especially with a kind of an e-commerce slant. We were working with a lot of founders. This was kind of the pre-aggregator days that everybody knows, pre-pandemic. 
working with brand owners primarily in the consumer and e-commerce space and helping them grow and, and sell their companies. And we've been doing that now for, for six years. And also last year, we are, became a joint venture partner in, a, in an accelerator growth fund called South Call. Same industry, we're, we're taking minority investment interest positions and helping brands grow to ultimately exit. So yeah, that's the short version. Awesome, awesome. So a wide breadth of knowledge in, in, in this space. And there's a lot of investment in bankers and a lot of brokers and stuff who have never had operator experience. And I know a lot of CEO, previous business owners don't even like to be called operators, but that's just my, that's the nomenclature we use for somebody who was in there, in the weeds of things in operating a business. So you know, some people call themselves CEO or owner or partner or founder or whatever. Kind of encompass at all of that operator status. You were operating the day to day operations of the business. Many of the people never had that, never cut their teeth on that part of the business. And there's something to be said by having been in the weeds and in the muck and wading through the swamp of, of business life that gives you an insight to what these customers are dealing with and what these customers need that a lot of people in the industry just don't have. And then let's talk. I mean, what are some of the craziest things? I know you've did so many different things. What are some of the craziest type of uh, deals you've done? Like we'll, we'll get into the like really odd, crazy businesses that you never knew existed. That's my favorite thing is like, I always tell people like, I, you know, had a guy in here that bought a manufacturing plant. It's like, what do you make? And they go, shrimp sorting machines. I'm like, I didn't yeah. even know those existed. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I feel like we're working with new product types all the time. I mean, I kind of going all the way back in my early days, mm -hmm. I can definitely say now we worked on the Enron deals back in the day. So before that company got crazy. I did deals with DreamWorks, the big movie company. Oh, that's a bunch cool. Of stuff with them. Yeah, we did. We kind of helped pioneer some of the first structured deals where you would actually sell bonds back to my movies that hadn't been made yet. So interesting. Yeah. And then in kind of this world, we've sold every kind of, I think, business from Victoria Night. We sold a Victoria nightgown business, which was interesting, based in, in the UK. I actually sold it to a really big strategic acquirer. We've sold businesses in cannabis, which is always interesting and household goods. And we sold a business in vinyl record protection. I mean, all the fun stuff. We were doing a marketing where we were buying marketing, a marketing roll up. We were buying marketing agencies and one of us, one of them pulled aside. The it's like, we own a second company, right? And two or three of them did it. Most of them because they had the second company that would market cannabis shops and they didn't put it on their main brand. They didn't want their main, I don't know what those names are. But it, whatever sure. it was, they wouldn't. Want, they didn't want them to like know that that was one of the brands they created and, and did. That said, this one was like we do a like some of our biggest income is from adult stuff, and I'm like mm. adult stuff, and they're like yeah, like Pornhub, and I was like ah okay. So the problem was is we were acquiring twenty something other agencies. Now we have to either tell everybody or make the decision that we are just not going down that path. And the rest of the executives made the decision like. Yeah, they don't fit in with the picture of everything else. Try to explain to 20-something LR. We had 20-something LOIs in the process, either already signed and already in due diligence. We were active, very crazily active. And mm -hmm. to try to convince everybody that, yeah, these guys should be part of this was something we just didn't want to go down that path. Yeah, it's a very, it's a, it's a narrow audience, for sure. Yeah. And <clears throat> anymore, it's like, you see what happened to Bud Light when they went against their customer base. You just don't know. It's a fickle market. So people yep. might adopt it and be okay with it, not care. And then people might also rebel against the whole thing and not, not touch it with a 10-foot pole. It could be a poison pill. So let's circle back around to what are the lessons learned that you learn from all this? Is there things that are universal from the big guys all the way down to this mid-tier level now and some of the smaller companies you've helped? Or yes. there's, so what's the universal, like, no matter what business you're in, X, Y, and Z needs to be in place? Yeah, I, I would say there's a few things that, you know, we were talking earlier, obviously, before the show about how we'll, we'll call them businesses, but also M&A markets. And so they tend to be kind of tiered. They have these groupings. And so looking at it just from the standpoint of any sort of acquisition, whether it be a large public company or, or a small private one, the real, we'll call it the story and, and, the, and the future and the risk profile around that business are the things that ultimately drive any deal, right? I mean, look, in its most simple form, an acquirer has to see the vision. And whether you're an owner trying to sell or you're an intermediary trying to help that owner sell, one of your biggest responsibilities is to try to paint a picture for the acquirer. And believe it or not, this is one thing that I found quite interesting is 
buyers oftentimes, I'm going to say the word, they're lazy, but I don't mean it in the traditional sense. What I mean is that they often need you to paint that picture for them. Right. And they need you to help them see why this company, given this choice or that choice or this potential, has such a bright future. And no matter what, whether it's, again, a big public company that has to explain it to their public shareholders or a private equity firm that has to explain it to their individual LP investors or the actual individual buyer market, they ultimately have to see that vision. And that's what's universal throughout, right? So anytime there's a company being sold, somebody somewhere has to convey a vision to the acquirers of that potential business and get them to see the world through their eyes. And I'd say that's pretty universal across any type of M&A activity. Lots of other things become nuanced and specific, but that one in particular is kind of like that fundamental principle. You know, I get it. I've been in business for years before I got into the real estate space, and it wasn't until I got into the real estate space before I realized that I'm different than most people. I can look in a space and go, okay, I'm going to do this, and visually lay things out in my head. 95% mm -hmm. of the people look at a space and think, let's well, going to be too small for this. There's a reason why homes are staged, right? The mm -hmm. people put fake furniture and do stuff in it is because most of us, most people on the planet, they see what they see and they just don't have any way or any method in their own mind to take something and look at what the future potential of something is. That's not a normal behavior. And I always thought it was because I do it. A lot of entrepreneurs do it, but a lot of these CEOs that are looking to acquire something, they're going to see what their first impression is. And unless there's a story being told, like the, what you're talking about, a vision, there's a story being told, painting a vision for them. Unless they can see something, they can see that staged, like this is what it looks like. Then they're, you're left up to whatever their first impression is. And yeah. And a lot of people, I think they have the erroneous, I think, impression that M&A is just always about the financials. It's always about the numbers, which it, that's a huge, huge part of it. But I'd say more than about the numbers, it's about the vision. It's about conveying a message and a view to the audience so that they're seeing clearly what you want them to see. Yeah. And that even goes for the smaller deals because these small deals are done built on relationships, the rapport between you and the seller. And did you paint a vision that you're a safe pair of hands for them? You 100%. And you mentioned that's another one that you just mentioned too, which is I'd say deals get done between people. They don't get done between, so far, AI is not doing, Chad, GPT, and Bard aren't doing deals with each other yet. Now we might get there, but it's deals are even at, again, the largest level. When I started my career at Bank of America, and for, for the, the older people, the audience here, they might remember a guy named Hugh McComb, who was the CEO of, the thing is, he would make deals all the time, like sitting next to a pool or at a bar or it's all about just that rapport that you would build with another CEO. It's, hey, it would make a lot of sense. I think we should acquire you guys. And then getting through it, anyone who's been through a deal process understands that the people involved are ultimately going to determine if that's a successful process or not. And so building rapport and knowing how to communicate and hopefully everyone's treating everyone with respect and they're being ethical and because those are the things that are needed for the for transactions to ultimately be successful so that's another universal one i would say i don't remember how many times i've had to tell uh small business owners that you, your attorney is going to kill this deal whether it's with me or anybody else he doesn't have personal skills or he, a lot of times they bring in their family attorney to do something like they don't know him and a at all even if i'm leaving like even if i know it's not a fit for me i'll just tell i'm pretty bold and straightforward with people i i don't care if i hurt your feelings so I just say, look, man, I know that guy's your family friend, but he, he's really hurting you. He doesn't know the space. He doesn't know how he's not, he's going to do more damage than he does good. I'm no longer interested for X, Y, Z. A lot of times it's just not of the right size or something else is going on. I said, but I just want to get here. Here's a couple of pointers, right? Go find yourself a mergers and acquisitions attorney that, that deals with transactions that they know what they're doing. I said, one of the guys, he didn't even know what an LOI was. He's like, we don't do anything that's not minding. I was like, okay, brother. Yeah, that's a problem. And it happens. I get it. You know, he's the one that set up the LLC, so he should be able to help me sell it. I'm like, yeah, two different things, right? It's a people business. One bad apple can run the whole party, right? I told him, said, your attorney is the drunk at the party that's like too rowdy. Like nobody wants to be around him. Nobody wants to tell him it's time to go home. I'm done here, so I'm going to tell you that guy needs to go home. <laughs> the owner was a little mad at him. Like, that's my brother-in-law, so-and-so. I'm like, I don't care. I'm just being honest with you. Being straightforward, I don't, you know, if it hurts your feelings, then that, just set with it. Let's move on.
a lot of people don't get that. Like this is a people business, even at the level. It's cool to know that it's even that like at the hundred million dollar deal, billion dollar deal. These things are made by relationships. And then there's teams that come into play and those teams have to build relationships. And at the end of the day, I would say as many deals failed because the financials were wrong as did by one team just didn't gel with the other team, right? They just right. couldn't see eye to eye and had different negotiation strategies or different personalities. And it just like, hey, this is a, a culture, mis, uh, culture mis, mismatch. It's just not going to work. Well, and I think that's where a lot of times that's where a lack of experience shows up. One of the places it shows up the most. And that's why, to your point, whether it's you need a good M&A attorney, you, you need a good intermediary who's got the experience to be able to identify and almost see these potholes coming before you hit them and be able to whoever you're working with on your side say, hey, by the way, look, I know how you feel. I know what you think, but let me tell you a little bit about how this is likely to go. And getting that really good advice, sometimes even if it's advice you don't want to hear, is just super important to ensuring success. And I think that's where I see the most where, again, a lot of times it, you don't know what you don't know. If, if you haven't been through this stuff a lot, you just, you don't know. So someone who's experienced has to be the one to maybe tell you. And, and you want those people to be, again, honest with you. It's most important to be honest. We, we talked about the different tiers inside of this. And for those of you guys that are listening in here, we do have some listeners that are listening here. They're thinking about selling their company. I kind of want to touch bases on those real quick. I can either, you can either do it, I can do it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong or however we want to do this. But I think that the different tiers, I'll just, I'll shoot at it and you tell me how far okay. off I was. Go for it. If you're doing the small business, you're say you're in an SBA loan qualified transaction, meaning that your business is going to be valued at 5 million or below. And you're doing say 1 million in EBITDA or seller discretion earnings profit or whatever you want to call it and below. Chances are you can get away with a decent broker. I would still go, if you're at the top end of that, Go with some of the brokers that have some of the certifications out there that have some of the, a lot of the brokers just don't have any barrier to entry. So, you know, look for some of the brokers that have the backing of some of these international certifications or whatever. You get to two billion or two million and above in EBITDA. Some of the smaller investment bankers will start working with you. And the difference is that small to medium businesses, those SBA loans, they'll sell, depending on the industry, anywhere from 2X to I guess if you're software or something, you can be a much higher. It's hard to tell because it's by industry, but average is 2X, 3X or whatever. Start working with investment bankers. You're doing $2 million in EBITDA or much bigger, $5 million in profit. Those things can, the multiples higher. They're going to, it's a totally different environment. The investment banker is going to sit down with you, really look at your financials. They're not going to post it on biz by sale. You'll never see those businesses on there. They're going to go out, handpick people that they know by businesses in the industry cold outreach people they know that should buy a business in your, your business and create relationships where they don't exist, right? I, I think it's the difference between the broker level and the investment banker is the broker is going to passively market you most of the time. And that mm -hmm. investment banking company is going to create an active marketing campaign. They're going to look at you, figure out who the perfect fit is, and they're going to go create a story about it and then go tell the story to people that should be listening. And instead of posting the story and hoping somebody finds it and reads it. And then is there a level above a publicly traded company or is that still that investment banker realm just at a different level? Yeah, it's just at a little bit of a different, a lot of times you'll just see some differences in the processes. I'd say we even kind of vary our processes by what's most appropriate too, but you may, you start to see things that are much more what I'll call very structured auction type processes as the businesses get larger. And whereas if they're more in that, we'll call it almost like the two to five ish or two to sometimes even two to 10 million of EBITDA, they tend to be a little more curated type processes. It still ultimately ends up in a bit of an auction at some point usually, but it's a little bit less like super structured and formal. Whereas once you're up to businesses that are going to sell for anywhere close to a hundred million or more, you're running usually a very tight, highly competitive auction, very structured. You're sending out teasers, NDAs come back. You're like, Hey, bids are due on this date at this time. And very, very much that's like a true middle market type process, but yeah, it just, it varies. And I think the, the point is like, what's appropriate and why I think that really becomes, and, and that's what you're alluding to, which is, Hey, if you have a business that looks like X, then this sort of is probably appropriate. If it looks a little, then this is appropriate. And it's, I think as a business owner. It's important to know what's probably appropriate and, and why and what to expect. 
from the process. What are you going to have to do? And what is your intermediary going to be doing for you? Because that, that varies a lot. I think one of the rumors I think I want to dispel here, I think a lot of these businesses that are doing two, three, four million dollars of profitable EBITDA and stuff, they think they still need to be in the broker realm. They don't realize investment bankers dip down into that range and yeah. they really should probably look around for an investment maker. I just think it's more of an active approach. You have more of a team looking at it. It's more of an auction environment where you're going to get multiple bids, multiple qualified bids. My goal is to grow whatever I buy and to, to make it attractive to an investment maker like yourself and the other people so that I can get that. And historically, from everything I've ever seen, investment makers tend to always play in a realm where they get higher multiples than brokers do. That's just it, mainly because you're bigger and, and more attractive to strategic acquirers, right? Mm -hmm. But also because it's well prepped. I think you guys do a really good job of making sure that everything's in line for those acquirers. Yeah. And I think there's a few things you hit on a couple of them there, as far as why those businesses tend to be valued at higher multiples. I think that's correct. I mean, first of all, and in general, we have a, a buyer class that's got deeper pockets, that's looking at a lot of opportunities. They're really good at assessing risk. I think they're very confident in their ability to assess risk. And so that gives them the confidence to bid higher because like, you know what? We feel really good about what we can do with this business. And we've done a lot of hard work and a lot of detail work around it. So if, you know, in a competitive situation where you've got multiple people in that boat, having done that work and feeling really confident about their ability to assess the risk and opportunity, it ultimately results in higher valuations. Because as you, I'm sure know, the more uncertain you are about the risk, the more conservative you're going to be in terms of value and literally anything. I mean, any asset, including a bit. So there's a lot of stuff going on right now about the market space, the uncertainty in the market and stuff. How true is that right now? Is the market still good and businesses still move? Is it, are, we, are we truly in a recession, depression, or whatever you call it? Or are things still actively uh, changing hands? Yeah, it's obviously, it's going to be sector specific, but not to go down too long of a rabbit trail, but the last year, a year and a half has been a slower, call it M&A world, right? And that's been driven by uncertainty in the macro picture, obviously interest rates, but not only interest rates going up, but also the tightening of credit, the ability for people and companies to borrow has gotten just a lot lower. And this kind of, is this recession, is it? coming? Is it not coming? What's the Fed going to do? There's been all of this uncertainty. And if you're in M&A markets long enough, you come to realize that uncertainty is bad for M&A deals, right? Because people aren't sure how to price. They're not sure how to assess. Going back to that point about assessing the risk, mm -hmm. they feel like it's murky. It's actually a lot better for someone or for markets to see risk as being negative, but clear than being uncertain, right? At least negative and clear, I can price for that. I can structure for that. But if I'm unclear, like, I don't know what to do. So there's been a lot of that going on. And so it's caused a lot of people to hold on to the wallet and say, you know what? I'm just going to wait to do deals until the picture is a little clearer. Now, there's always some activity, even in slow markets. There's always deals, good deals or deals that say to happen tend to happen even in a, we'll call it a slower market. And that's what's been happening. What you've seen is you know, everywhere from small deals to big deals, those are the two types of deals that have continued, either where someone, again, a company is in trouble, they really need to sell, or a person is in trouble, they really need to sell. Or the fit is just so perfect that a deal just makes sense, right? And now the, what's cool about anybody who's looking at maybe selling the company is, we're starting to see the clouds open up a little bit. The clarity is coming. And like one of the gauges we always use is we get a lot of inbound inquiry from a lot of different potential acquirers, especially private equity, but also a lot of strategics too, saying, hey guys, you know what? Make sure we're seeing your deals. We want to make sure. So all of a sudden, I'd say in the last, for a few months, let's say five, six months, there wasn't a whole lot of that going on. In the last month or two, that's picked way back up. And so. You're seeing people start to feel like the environment's getting less certain. And so what you should see is eventually that deal activity will follow. Valuations will start to appreciate again because they're down to be like from the peak of like 21 was kind of a valuation peak for a lot of businesses. 
it's probably 35, 40%, even though you see the S&P 500 isn't like, but below that sub, it, valuations are probably down 30, 35% from that peak right now. But it's starting to feel like we were kind of turning back up a little bit. And so I feel like over the next 12 months, you're going to start to see things pick up a little bit. You're seeing, and we're doing a lot more, I'd say pre-market prep for deals. And it's kind of, you can feel it in the, in the vibrations and you're seeing it in the data. So. And today's sponsor is Reconciled. Are you an entrepreneur or business owner thinking about your exit strategy? Or maybe you've just landed a business through acquisition and the books just aren't the way you need them to be. Let me tell you about Reconciled, your dedicated partner for industry-leading virtual bookkeeping and accounting services. Reconciled pairs you with skilled professionals who empower you to grow your business and prepare for success, whether that's your exit or taking that new acquisition to top performance. Imagine having high-level financial management without expanding your team, from bookkeeping to CFO services, tax advisory, and even fully outsourced accounting, Reconciled has got you covered. They help you make the best business decisions, keeping your end goal in mind. And the best part? Reconciled understands acquisitions as they have acquired three accounting firms in the past three years, and their founder, Michael Lee, mentors others in searching for acquisition, raising capital, or trying to aggressively scale. Reconcile invoices your clients, pays your bills, and delivers clear and accurate financial reports every month automatically. Ready to streamline your financials and prepare your business for the next big step? Visit Reconcile.com today and let them get your books in order. Reconciled, making bookkeeping a breeze. That's Reconcile.com. So 30 to 40%, is that because of the industry sector you guys are in, e-commerce and, and commerce and stuff, or is that pretty much industry-wide, you it's think? Pretty much in, it's pretty much across all industries. There's a couple of exceptions. I've seen SaaS seen, take a hit, right? I've seen SaaS yep. take a huge hit. And then the e-commerce, like the we're going to talk about here in a little bit, I think, the Amazon aggregators and stuff. Those Amazon stores being sold took a huge hit. They were getting crazy. Value. Two years ago, they were. I know people are trying to sell theirs for those huge valuations. I'm like, where are you getting mm -hmm. that number? Oh, that's what the market's paying. I was like, sell it yeah. now, sell it yesterday. Oh, you know, what are you waiting we, for? We sold, we sold some Amazon centric businesses for over 10 multiple. Like, I would say, yeah, yeah 10, 12, yeah. 15. I've had people, yeah. somebody offered me 15 X for my, for my Amazon stores. Like, what are you waiting on? What are you talking yeah. to me? Sign the damn paper, right? Like, well, it was a double, it was a double whammy. I know we're going to talk about it later. You know, you had the pandemic, which in and of itself just drove so much more activity online. But then you also had a bunch of capital raised specifically for those types of business. So you had kind of the, the, the double whammy, which drove valuations way yeah. high and they've come way down. But no, the valuations in general across the board on especially private deals across all sectors, 30, 35 is about average from the peak. Interesting. I've seen a lot of activity, maybe just because the level I'm playing at inside of the show and stuff, the people I interview, but in what I call safe industries or passion industries. Pet, pet supplies, veterinarian services, things that like almost, re you're going to take care of your pet, whether the economy is good or bad. You're going to, yep. that type of stuff. I think there's a few other passion industries that I think survive almost any economy. If you think about like where I'm from, the, the redneck neighborhood, bass lures and bass gear and bass stuff. Economy is good or bad. If somebody comes up with a ba new bass lure that catches fish, you're going to buy it. Golf, there's passion industries. There's certain things around golf. I think that probably falls in that realm that are irrational. But I don't see anybody moving in those realms as much as I do, like a lot of stuff in pet services and pet thing, private healthcare type of stuff. I see people mm -hmm. sticking with that because you're going to take care of your own self. And that's everything from a lot of these newer type of telemedicine and that type of like different types of medical. I see people moving in that space a lot. And that happens a lot during uncertain times because those industries are fairly stable, whether the economy is good or bad, right? That's right. Yeah. You get ones that are more resistant. Right. And I think there's also a, a distinction between what I'll call almost like a markets driven, like there's markets driven trends and then there's e economy driven trends. And I think so far what we've seen is even though there's been a lot of recession talk, the data says we're not there. The data says the consumer is actually still okay. Even though of course, inflation, big topic and very real, it's kind of the silent killer, right, to your wallet is inflation. So I think a lot of what's, it's much more, I would say, a markets driven type of mode that we've had over the last year or so. And another one to your list that we've seen hold up really well is beauty. Beauty holds up pretty well, regardless of economic conditions too. And we've seen actually, that's been one of the more robust deal activity sectors. We've got a few beauty clients. We love beauty clients for sure. 
Well, it's almost too, like, it's almost in a way it's weird. It's both cyclical and counter cyclical almost at the same time, because when people are feeling the pinch in the wallet, they're looking for those little splurges, like the little yeah. ones that make me feel good. Like I don't have the money maybe for the big, but, and those things that just make you feel good about yourself like yeah. that, those have to stay on the menu. So uh, let's talk about that consumer project and products and e-commerce space and stuff. Where do you see that going? I know that there's a big problem right now with the Amazon aggregators. We can integrate that into this conversation. But if somebody's in the B2C space and they've got consumer products, maybe on Amazon, maybe on Shopify or whatever out there, and they're doing okay, what's the market look like for them? And what should they be looking eyeballing as far as if they're looking to exit or if they're looking to acquire something? Sure. Yeah, I'll kind of start just like from a macro standpoint, just the consumer in general, like what we've seen, the behavior, right? What we saw is during the pandemic, you had all of this spending shift from heavily from services into goods and a lot of those more online. Right? And then as the pandemic was you know, easing and people were getting back to life, you saw the opposite where a lot of the spending shifted from goods into services like travel and eating out and all that stuff you couldn't do, right? When you were locked in your house. And so now we're seeing it start to rebalance again, which is good because basically consumer products has gone through a little bit of a desert period here as they were, especially e-commerce, because back to double whammies, we go post-pandemic, a lot of the online spending goes back to brick and mortar. At the same time, a lot of good spending goes to services. So e the e-commerce guys got hit the hardest. They had a big party and then they had a really bad hangover. And so, so now that whole thing, that's all stabilizing. And the reason why that's important is the acquirer universe knows that. And they're watching and they say, okay, cool. Like now's a good time. Like it feels like a lot of these businesses maybe have gone through whatever darkest days they were going to have. They've gone through. There's obviously nuance at every level. But you can start to feel like maybe the trend is your friend a little bit when it comes to consumer. So that's one thing. And granted, there's that still that little bit of the looming. Is there a recession, not a recession? That's still a little bit out there. But I think that it was this big experiment, right? Like this that hasn't really ever happened in human history, because what happened in the last pandemic, the world was a very different place. So there was all of this learning that just happened over the last three years, especially if we're going to focus it on e-commerce and consumer products. I was like, all right, what has this told us about how consumers behave? How do they buy stuff? How do they buy stuff online? What do they care about? What are the things that are going to make a, you know, a business successful? Knowing what you know now, right? And specifically around the Amazon kind of experiment, let's call it, that evolution was super interesting because... We were around before a bunch of capital got ra raised specifically in these kind of aggregator vehicles. And we knew what the market, so the market for those businesses was a lot thinner than valuations were lower, but also to, to put it bluntly, there were a lot of people in consumer, why I say people like private equity and other like big buyers who looked at those Amazon businesses as not even real businesses. They, uh, we, they would say that all the time. That's not a real business. I've got Jeff Bezos risk. He wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. My business is screwed. So it, it was, it was fighting its way through that perception. Then all of a sudden you had aggregators, they started pre pandemic and then with the pandemic, it just exploded. And there was a theory there that if you bought a brand that was doing a lot of business on Amazon, on the marketplace, as long as it had a lot of reviews and good reviews, that was the thing that was going to protect your market share. That was pretty much what it boiled down to, right? Now, of course, other things mattered. The, the actual margins, there were other things. But like the theory really boiled down to if we can pull all, we'll take a bunch of small things. We're going to buy them for a good price. We're going to pull them together. And that's going to make this bigger thing worth multiples of the smaller things. So one plus one equals three. And in the meantime, we're going to put all these quote unquote smart people in charge of these brands. And they're going to really run them much better than the founders, right? That was the theory. Well, the theory didn't work out. And what they found out about the consumer was, you know what? That market share, just because you have a lot of reviews, just because the reviews are 4.5 stars, that's not enough. That's not enough to protect your market. The competitive forces are so strong that if you're simply relying on that, like you will have a problem. 
If you're not building a real brand, if you're not doing real product development, if you're not actually evolving, you're, you will lose, you will eventually, and unfortunately, it tends to happen quickly and precipitously. The fall will come and that's what happened. And then with the aggregators, they just had a bunch of leverage on top of it. They were mostly debt funded, very expensive debt, right? That whole thing happened. It basically, the market for Amazon focused businesses went through the roof. Lots of deals got done. We did a lot of those deals on our side too. And now we're kind of in the aftermath of saying, what did we learn? I think we learned a couple of things. One is what I just said before about you're not as well protected as you thought. I think the other thing that we learned was, and brand is important. The thing we would hear a lot of times from consumer private equity who would look at these businesses and like, I just, I can't stand that my competition is right next to me and not, it's like, they're right next to me. Like I do not get the consumer's focused attention just on me. And that's what really, that's what I really don't like, but they also like money. So eventually they realize, well, there's so much money to be made. Maybe I can be okay with that. But I think it comes down to like the ability to take something in a lot of your audience that wants to maybe buy something that's smaller, grow it to something bigger and experience that multiple kind of expansion in e-commerce there's fundamentals you just can't get away from. Like you just, whether you're on Amazon or you're not Amazon, Amazon should just be seen as a channel, just like a direct to consumer channel, or honestly, even a whole, it's just a channel. It can't be your business. If that is your business, it's going to be very difficult. So the fundamentals you can't get away from. I know some people who did really well on Amazon and the competitive nature on Amazon is actually both intriguing and very scary. It's a very big marketplace, but I'll give you a good example. I know somebody who basically he made his money on Amazon. The way he did it is he'd find products that were selling really well. And we'd go through their reviews and figure out, he would just look at all their two star and three star reviews and figure out what the flaws on the product were. And then he could go to third world China or whatever the places of manufacturing and say, Hey, I'd like to order 10,000 units of this product. Like, here's a good example. He found a tactical flashlight and one of the reviews is the spring breaks off after six months. He says he was an electronics nerd by trade, and he just told him, I'll, I'll order 10,000 units of this. I want you to solder it with this, this level of solder, this type of connection. He just gave him different specs to build it on. Now, when his reviews show up, Amazon, because it's such a similar product, puts them side by side, and he never gets the reviews as he builds off sales. He never gets the reviews that, that it breaks. Now, right. uh, before long, he displaces the other guy. And he made a lot of money that way. What, what he learned, though, later on, I'll tell you, is he made a lot of money, made millions. He's doing really well with it. He won't let me interview him and put it out public because, well, Bob, what am I going to tell you? He said, hey, we're going to, not the tactical flashlight, but two of his other products is like, hey, we're going to start selling that as an Amazon product. You can either mm -hmm. sell us or store or compete with us. Yeah. They literally wrote him a letter, sent him, a, it wasn't even like a call or anything. They sent him a letter saying, we're entering in your space. We'd like to talk to you about buying your store. You can either sell it to us or compete with us. We're, we're going to have an Amazon product in that line. Like, yeah. what are you going to do? You're going to be side by side with Amazon when you think the algorithm is going to favor you? Yep. So he ended up having to sell off two of his product lines, right? He had product lines like that. He did things like charging cables and just random stuff that he found where they did good. They had a lot of volume in the sales. There was a lot of two and three star rating. He would improve upon them and just mm -hmm. make little improvements, order a shipping container of them and see how well they sell. And the next thing, yeah, Amazon shut him out of two. His, cut his profit in a third, by the way. So now he's got yeah. one or two products they don't want to be in yet, but he's just a, his days are numbered before they decide they want to be in that space. So Anytime, and I've never got into the space for that reason, anytime a single player can change your day, I'm a little concerned about it. Well, right. I mean, it goes back to what I was saying before. It, it creates a risk profile that some people can't get comfortable with at all. Other people can get comfortable, but they want to price around it, right? Like, I, hey, I'll invest in this or buy this, but I know there's so much risk and it's binary type risk that... I've got to be very conservative with how I price that. That's how they, that's how a lot of people would view it. I think though, one of the important things that we try so hard to counsel clients and I think kind of advice I would offer anyone who's a business owner, I had to do this myself as a business owner too, is you have to just have an eyes wide open, I think, mentality about where you are, who you are. And ultimately what you want to be. And I think that when it comes to even the topic of selling your company, it's much, much better to say, okay, this is where I'm at. This is kind of the tier I'm in, or this is the grouping I'm in. How do I feel about that? 
Am I good with it? Let's translate that into a multiple. Let's say that my type of business, as much as I love my business and think it's the best business on the planet, my type of business, yeah, like I probably best case might be valued at four times EBITDA because of whether it's a size or a sector or a risk or whatever. So if you look at that and say, okay, that's where I'm at. I'm very realistic about it. Now, what do I think about it? If I'm good with it, I keep doing what I'm doing. If I'm not good with it or I want to be something else, how do I become whatever that thing is? But it has to start with a very just realistic, I'd say, a clear view of what you really are. And I think I see that a lot of times business owners, either they don't have the right people around them or they're not willing to just say, hey, th let's just be super realistic about this. It's only going to help you because, like I said, if you really, really want to be something else, then you got to know where you're starting from. And that's, I think I 100% agree with what you just said. And I'll add one thing to that is understanding what the next level is. Like, if you understand that my typical business sells at 4X, the, the next question to ask is who in my space, my industry sells for more? And what is that? Maybe it's mm -hmm. 6X or even 10 or 12X. And why are they selling for that X and not mine? That's because they got their EBITDA up to 5 million and they're strategic. Now they're interesting to people that are public and you can make a difference to their bottom line when they acquire you. So mm -hmm. what's your game to get there, right? Uh, there, right. A lot of people don't understand. And, and for those who are listening, you got a small business, so you got to understand that there are thresholds inside of this that you start to open the eyes of the bigger players and they're willing mm -hmm. to pay more for you because in order for you to have gotten to their interest level, you have got a different business. You've got different systems and process. It takes a different business to go from, I'm going to do a million dollars a year in EBITDA to 5 million. And especially depending on the industry, it's a totally different game, right? It's a, the systems and processes are different. The scale of how many people you have is different. But if you can open those eyes and know, I, I think of it all the time, manufacturing and, and brick and mortar companies, they stay in that 2X, 3X, 4X until they get big. Some of the PE firms, they don't dip down below 25 million in revenue. Right. So if you're not right. producing five to ten million dollars EBITDA or or three to four million dollars EBITDA, you're just not going to get the attention of the big international players that would strategic buyers that could pay more than that. So what's your game plan to get there? If you need six X to retire and hit your retirement goals, who are you talking to help you get there? Because you, you, especially a lot of the guys are like, I'm going to double my business and, and sell it. It's like, cool, you've been in business for 30 years. You haven't doubled it yet. Who are you going to bring on your team to help you get there? Now I've right. got this. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm okay to yeah. tell you, like, no, you haven't done it in 30 years. You're not going to do it in the next two. Find somebody that has and have them help you. Yeah. And on consumer, I'll, I'll give you another one. Size is definitely like financial revenue size, EBITDA size is always a super big driver, but they, it just kind of in consumer, I'll give you another one that, that we run into a lot is you, you have a product, but what, is there anything unique about it? Is there a moat around it? Have you basically just taken something and maybe you just put, is it a pure white label or something like that's another thing where even at a smaller level, you can be more strategically valuable because you've done the work to develop a unique product. Maybe you have IP around that product patents or whatever. And you say, you know what, now I'm going to take what I've learned about this market, right? So far in my history, and I'm going to apply it to a unique product. And then when an acquirer comes along and they say, hey, oh, wow, you have a real unique product here that with my resources. I can skyrocket. And then they're saying they're salivating to get their hands on it, even though you're not that big because they know what they can do with it and they know there's protection there. So even something like that's another sort of way to think about uh, how do I make myself more interesting, more valuable given certain parameters? Yeah, I, I get that. And I had a company I was slightly interested. It was a vitamin company of all things, subscription-based. They didn't sell on Amazon stuff, but they mostly, mo most of their money was through subscription. They got a monthly recurring and the guy was really like <clears throat> talking about the uniqueness of his product and his subscription base. But what he did, they did everything in house. And I was like, you do realize that I didn't say this to him, but to my team. So you realize we can take that product. He's charging $35 a bottle. He's saying it's cost her $10 a bottle. I know I can count 10 manufacturers right now that'll make that formulation exactly for $2 a bottle, right? Of most of these vitamin yeah. companies, they're white label companies. You basically they are. give your formula to some company that does really good organic or whatever you want them to do, the criteria you give them. And, mm -hmm. and they have all the rules and licensing and food handling and all the stuff they need to do it right. And they can come in and cut your cost down because they do it at volume. And yep. uh, he was like, no, we have to do this in-house. Like, no, you don't. It's like, do you have any patent formulas? Do you do anything 
really unique. Like, do you have any patent where you're encapsulating the vitamins? Are you doing something cool? And he's like, no, we just, it's this formula. I was like, I don't think your moat is big as you think it is. Mm -hmm. And his brand was built off of 20 years of selling subscriptions and, and we could continue to do it. It wasn't a bad business and stuff. Unfortunately, he had some other stuff going on that would take some cleaning up to do. I'm friends with him. I don't want to say what it was. Okay. It's just a financial difficulties by a partner. Mm -hmm. Things that are going to show up in due diligence for anybody. He told me it in confidence. Anybody that does due diligence is going to find that there's some money moving around that is interesting. But that wasn't the roadblock for me was like, I know good and well, if this thing really takes off, if somebody with a bigger brand is going to mirror that formula and stomp on him because he's at that plane. He's not that thing where he's not at anybody's radar yet. He's, you know, he's approaching something where he's going to get in one of the big guys' radar and they're going to realize that formula is selling really well. And then he's just not going to be able, they're going to make it faster, cheaper and sell to his audience. And he's going to have a hard time. Yeah. And that's a lot of, you know, that point about kind of really trying to know where you are, like know what your position is in the market. I think as a business owner, it's hard if, if you don't have a lot of M&A experience and stuff like it's a lot of people, there are things that just they don't think of just because they just don't know to think of them. And with that mindset, that exit mindset, it was like, oh, even if you're not exiting, you don't know when you're at, you just know at some point my goal, which I would argue some people, if you own a company, that should always be the goal. You don't know when, but and, yeah. and but that should always be the goal at some point. Granted, I'm a little biased. Just knowing exactly where you are and where you want to be and, and checking in on that consistently. It, it goes to me well beyond at least once a year getting evaluation. Like this is well beyond. It. It's really understanding that market position and especially as it relates to where an acquirer might come from and what they might pay. Right. That's the thing that you always have to be just taking the pulse of as a business owner. At least I would advise that. And it gives you a roadmap, right? Like if you understand where the industry is and what they value, then you have a little bit of a guidance as to and right now the hot thing is recurring or reoccurring revenue, right? Yep. That you get paid a higher premium on if you get a if you get a regular check from your customers and, and it's steadied and contracted, you get a higher premium on those dollars. Service industries don't think about that. A lot of big, even things like personal service industries, they don't think about service contracts and other stuff that can get a higher multiple on it. But if you do what you're saying, you keep an eye on what the industry is doing and what people value, then you can shape your business to where if you ever do have to exit, you're, you've got what the market wants. Yep. Yeah. And, well uh, said. I, I would say it's that if you don't know, because you're making decisions every day about where to spend your time and money in terms right. of your business. So. It's good to be saying, I'm spending my time and my money on the things that are going to matter ultimately what comes to a, a sale. Again, along the way, there can be some other shorter term motivations, but if you don't know that the time and investment in that particular thing will be worth it, you probably mm. won't do it, right? So even that, as you probably know, if it's a product or a service business, you're trying to invest in recurring revenue, whether it's contracts or how to get my customers to repeat purchase more. That takes time and energy investment to make that stuff happen, but the return is there. So it's yeah. much better to spend it there than somewhere else where no one's going to pay. I've got one little business I still own. It's in Oklahoma that if I get recurring business, I don't think it's good. Oh, yeah. I, own a, I own a pest control company. If they call me back, I didn't do something right. I say that things come back. Like we get the same customers over and over every fall because uh, ants just come back. And we're not allowed to put anything in the ground strong enough to last more than a 12 month cycle. So in the fall in, the, in Oklahoma, and sometimes in the spring, we need to go back and hit it again, and they call us back. But uh, usually, if you're pest control clients, unless it's a rental, like we've got a bunch of Airbnbs that we do a, reg a quarterly check on for, for bed bugs because people bring them in. We're running out of time here. Let's make sure everybody knows yeah. what is the target client for you? What are you looking for? What is the EBITDA size? Kind of what industries you're looking for? So if somebody's listening yeah. and they have a business that fits your criteria, they can you know reach out to you and get some help. Yeah, I mean, most of our clients are consumer products businesses. Some are e-commerce first, others are not. But just I'd say consumer. Usually our EBITDA is going to be kind of two to 10. I'd say from a revenue standpoint is usually more appropriate. We're usually kind of five to 30 mm -hmm. in the revenue range. And the way we engage with our clients, more often than not, our clients are engaging with us, I'd say early in their journey. And we're helping them essentially grow into their goals. And then ultimately taking them to market through a very kind of traditional sell side M&A process. It's going to feel like what we talked about before, that 
curated and or kind of full auction style process. As far as sectors, we're super active in health and beauty. We're super active in juvenile, anything for the home. I won't say we specialize in any particular one, but those are the areas we do a lot of stuff in is in those worlds. And how do you want them to reach out to you? Yeah, you can just email me. I mean, we'll have that up or just go to gw.partners. So we're not a .com or a .partners. So you can find us there and there's actually a form there. They can fill out a content form and we'll have an intro discussion and learn more about you and your goals and see if there might be a fit to work together. And if anybody wants to learn from you or see other content and stuff, are you active anywhere on the social media spectrum, like, like LinkedIn or Twitter or anything like that? LinkedIn, yep, for sure. We're on there. We don't tweet or anything. So LinkedIn's the spot. All right. Well, we'll call that a show, man. Thank you for being here today. We really, really learned a lot and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Love it. Appreciate it. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and to decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now